Hello. Can, are we coming coming through out there? Yes, you are. Awesome. So why don't we go ahead and get started now with uh, a round of introductions. Um, I see a few people online, so why don't we start with those that have dialed in on the phone and then those that are dialed in on the computer. I'll start Tom Bascom with Linkspace. Hi, this is Francella with Next Century Cities. Hello, this is Kelly Coleman. I am a growth strategy consultant. This is Anna Higgins from the Internet Society. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Anya from the IGF Secretariat. I'm just here as a very passive uh, observer, very interested to just see the results of your open call. Thanks for calling in. I know it's late over there. Um, did we miss anybody? No, okay. So, um, doing the room, uh, Dustin Loop, co chair IGF USA. Steve Del Bianco with NetChoice. Rob Winterton from NetChoice. John Moore from uh, DC ISOC or ISOC DC. Melinda Clem, IGF USA and affiliates. Alex McLeod, Act Slash the App Association. Awesome. So, let's go ahead and get started. For those that are online i'll be going through some of the documents they can also be accessed through this web page which i will also post in the chat for your easy access so we'll start off by reviewing the results of the open call for topics um, and before we do that i should note that received uh, apologies from Shane Tews, Susan Chalmers, and George Stowski. Um, so getting to the result of the open call for topics, we had a pretty good turnout, especially considering that everything else that was kind of going on during that same time period that captured people's attention. Um, we received 82 submissions from 52 unique individuals, as was uh, set out, it was fine to submit up to three topics per individual, so no issues there. We received 37 from the private sector, 26 from civil society, eight from the technical community, five from government, and four that either declared none or other, including myself. Um, and if you compare that to previous years, last year we got 75 submissions from 63 individuals in 2018. It was 96, but it was from 39 individuals. And then from in 2017, we had the submissions from 26 individuals. So I think we're, you know, doing a good job of getting more contributions each yeah. each year. So it's not necessarily a straight upward line, but I think we're we've definitely grown a lot from. 2017, 2018, and I also think that it's worth noting in the unique individual number that one individual may be submitting three topics, but they might be doing it on behalf of their entire organization and that organization's members that they've discussed with. So it could, you know, be reflecting the inputs of dozens of people. One submission for trade associations or orgs of some kind. Sure. Right. Um, or multiple organizations could submit. Because <laughs> when I net, well, we're net choice, right? And uh, trade associations. So I sent the entire call for subjects, topic suggestions to all of my members, and they all said, and I had prepared draft lists. And they all said, "Sounds like a great list. Sounds like a great list. Put them in." 
Yeah. None of them want to put them in themselves. You probably have the same situation. Yeah. Like we trust you. Yeah, pretty much. But there's a lot going on. You got this. So we'll start off by just highlighting an overview of where kind of where people seemed to express their interest, and then we will open the floor to everybody that is at this meeting to make sure that we didn't kind of miss anything in our review. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit about how this feeds into the survey and the subsequent process around that. Um, so I'm just going to run through these in no particular order. Um, we received several submissions regarding encryption, both from the social and political implications of that, um, with also some interest in how it's being tied to Section 230 protections and uh, some interest in the technical aspects of it, of course, as well. Uh, there were also a lot of submissions regarding kind of what the IGF refers to as just data. Last year was referred to as data governance. Um, a lot of those were focused around privacy, uh, things like federal legislation and where we're at on that, uh, the NIST privacy framework. Um, a bunch of encryption questions, surveillance. Yeah. Don't they all fall under data governance? Yeah, they do. A lot of surveillance once come up, encryption. Yeah, a lot of surveillance, um, the human rights implications, especially for journalists and activists, what's happening at the international level. So there's a lot of interest from a lot of different angles there. Another area, I counted almost uh, 25 mm -hmm. in the data governance space, which to the extent that they're, they're unique, we wouldn't want to jam 25 topics under one yeah. and then might argue that we use this exercise to maybe cut that into maybe two potential. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I think there are, I'd like that people put some descriptions in there because I think some of these have a nuance of this um, concept of the economics of it and the business models that which is very different perspective um, than just purely is what should the law include. So. Right. Sometimes we tune ourselves to what is hot in this town. Mm -hmm. And what will be hot in this town is Graham's bill, the Earnet Act, which try to stop encryption by threatening to take away 230, right? Things like that. It's going to be such a hot topic this summer. It's an election year. so. It, we had a few submissions of topics on election right. security and um, preserving democracy, free expression, platform, moderation. All that can be moved into an election themed topic and it will end up getting picked. Mm -hmm. And it's a place to discuss what otherwise would sound a little bit dry content moderation, political content. Yeah, it's just the thoughts. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's. You make a, a good point there and that a lot of these issues could be cut in a number of ways and the same topic could be included in cybersecurity and elections. So it's not necessarily, a, we don't intend to reflect these submissions word for word in the survey. It's a, an exercise of gathering a lot of themes and figuring how we, how we can package them into about 12 to 15 survey topics, which uh, last year we had people rank and uh, are looking at doing the same thing again this year. Um, another issue that there was a lot of interest in was around um, what the global IGF is calling trust, which includes cyber security and safety is what they called it last year. Yeah. Um, and under this, there was a lot of interest in cyber attacks and the the coordinated response, including the importance of public and private partnerships and industry partnerships in terms of sharing information and coordinating on how they should respond to these cyber attacks. There was also interest in the security around 5G and IoT mm -hmm. and the supply mm -hmm. chain surrounding mm -hmm. that, uh, critical infrastructure as well as elections. I counted roughly 11 things that fit into the old cybersecurity and safety, everything that yeah. Dustin just said plus uh, uh, breaking down silos, which sounds 
I it sounds like cybersecurity is part of it, but it more is about structure and institutions, perhaps. That's how I read that one, too. Yep. So I thought maybe I put it in the wrong place. And then uh, DNS abuse, which is like a broad category in the ICANN world, right? Affiliates and others have led the way on a framework for DNS abuse. And within there is deceiving people through trademark deceptions. It fits in there. Mm -hmm. And whereas if you ask the IP attorneys, they'll all say, make it all about who is in trademark protection, which is the last thing we want to talk about. So no, under the rubric of DNS abuse, DNS abuse can include all the who is stuff. I mean, we've had enough activity in the DNS area that it might even be proposed as one of the 15 panels. Yeah, I, I do looking at the, um, and, and should also emphasize here for those in the room and those on the phone that this is an open discussion. So if if you take you know if you've reviewed these call for topics and would like to chime in at any point, please uh, just go ahead and chime in. I'll try to monitor the uh, the hands online, but also just feel free to make your voice heard. Yeah, and um, if you didn't do your homework, it's so easy you can do it live. There's, there's a link in the email. Yeah, yeah, there's an interactive web page that should help with that. So with the session last year, I was the lead and, and I also acted as the moderator for the cybersecurity and trust section. We did was structured it so that we had a person from a certain player of the stack and then they were able to talk about, you know, whether it was an encryption or all these different topics from their perspective, right? We had uh, Centrelink, we had DNS and, you know, so we had a couple of layers represented. It was an interesting approach because then you felt like you had a big got discussion these. of hackback. Yes. <laughs> And you threw DNS in there as a sector, as opposed to like a DNS talk. Completely, yeah. yeah. So we've done, I mean, so the point is, last year we did it, and we tried to get pan internet and get all the sectors. So I wouldn't have a problem if we wanted to focus this year, if we thought, I mean, given the number of comments we had, if we went that way, to try it. Yeah, a DNS topic? Is that what you're thinking yeah. of being? Yeah. Yeah. If we want to talk what about that you... and then bring forward, like you said, then say, okay, if we're going to look at the DNS sector, why don't we talk about each of these different topics and as it relates, whether it's, you know, how does privacy and, and data fit through, how does encryption and, and how do all these things impact it? You could take that approach. And it would turn into a, a place to complain about ICANN. Because any time an interested party doesn't get their way in an ICANN process, they want to blow up the line. Well, that's another concern I had because of the way one of the topics was no. presented. Right. The domainers. It was definitely a, an attack on the institution of ICANN and credibility. So that's definitely. Think about it. There's two attacks. The domainers are mad at ICANN because of the prices of org names and com names because they have millions, tens of yep. millions of names. And then the IP attorneys are angry at ICANN because ICANN it's not navigated a path in compliance with GDPR. Mm -hmm. So they're mad, and because they didn't get their way, these two communities want to blow up ICANN. Yeah. I just say this to indicate we would attract a lot of interest. Yeah. If we had a topic on DNS, it would it would be a topic that included a discussion of the governance structures on the DNS, yeah. which mainly is ICANN. There's a, actually, there was a Wall Street Journal today about yeah. the company. On last week, on org, I know. On, well, and there's a, this week about a, a company that bought thousands of domain names and then you use fake names and actually cheated people. That's right. That's right. But that's a good concrete example that affects people. So, I mean, do we, I was talking to Dodson before you guys came in, I was nervous about an IGF USA putting a DNS oriented, ICANN oriented panel on there because only a subset of our um, yeah. target audience pays a lot of attention to ICANN. They did during the transition. We had a we had a yep. great panel during the transition. Yep. But we're not in a transition now. Yeah, I do think though, regarding the DNS, I mean, we'll, we don't want there to be too many topics because then the survey becomes too hard to We're thinking 15, uh, no I more than 15. No more than 15, 15 yeah. like last year. Yeah, because yeah. we're gonna, if we do the rank order again, 15 is about, about the, all the we can handle. Of, yeah. Everybody completed it. And how many did, 120? Uh, 100 and, 120, yeah. yeah. We had a good response. Impressive. Pretty pretty impressive. Impressive. And every one of them filled it all out. Yep. All of it. <laughs> they complained. <laughs> Several complained. <laughs> but they did it. <laughs> and, and it took an average of six and a half minutes, which is not too bad. Really not.
want that at all. Um, <laughs> but on, on the note of the DNS, I do think that there was a clear heightened interest. And if we're able to fit that in within the 15, then I think that we could justify having its own. If we did, if we did, and we, we stole then some of the stuff that would have been under general abuse in cybersecurity, and we don't, it would also steal some of the interest in uh, examining institutions. Because if you say examine institutions, there's two, the IGF and ICANN. If we make it about DNS abuse, it becomes the ICANN, and there won't be enough interest in a IGF plus. Right. Hey, so we've got uh, a Sorry, this is Matt uh, from INTA on the line. Um, I would I would just challenge the idea that it would be entirely about ICANN if it was a DNS um, related topic, because uh, you know DNS to an extent is also about attribution of you know attackers and that sort of thing with phishing attacks. So you know it, it's not necessarily just going to be one uh, one sided or about institutions. It's also kind of a general cybersecurity. Um, uh, discussion, I would say. We, we think you're right, Matt. And we were saying earlier that uh, the IP attorneys would show up if their clients would pay them and they'll bitch about who is, and the domainers would show up and, and bitch about uh, prices for their portfolios. And so we need uh, someone okay. else. We need to become a tax on ICANN. So the moderator has to be strong willed. Yeah. And, okay, and that's fair. Have, and, have, and have someone who comes from other yeah. concerns, yeah, other domainers. Yeah, exactly. And I, I can attest to the fact that a lot of a lot of our representatives would show up to that. Um, that is true. <laughs> summer in uh, summer in Matt, uh, DC yeah. to complain about ICANN. <laughs> Book your travel now. We didn't do. We didn't really have ICANN last year. We did mention data governance and accountability theme for the IGF, and you remember Halpert went through the CCPA, the California yeah. law. Mm -hmm. That was I don't remember. That was Good. one of the. But I don't remember right. any discussion of GDP, um, of ICANN and who is. No, no nobody no. talked about yeah. the EP, EPDP in any of the sessions or anything like that. Yeah. So. There was one called Internet Governance Institutions. How do we prevent the IGF from becoming the Internet Governance Failure? Well, these were the proposed. These aren't the eight that. This is what you sent me this morning. From last that was um, what we used last year as the panel names and descriptions. Of the eight that we picked, because there's more than eight in here. Those, those are the 15 that were asked. So when right. we put the 15 up, we had descriptions that we cribbed together from everybody's topic suggestion. So I don't think that, um, that that scored. I don't think that made the list, did it, last year? Prevent the IGF from becoming the internet governance failure. I don't think that. No. I mean, that's been a uh, discussion afterwards when we compared different international meetings and the UN and stuff. That was a post post IGF meeting we had here. Yeah. You know what? The Internet Governance Institutions, that one I just mentioned, ranked. It was the seventh in terms of being ranked number one, and it was ninth in terms of being in the top three. But I don't remember we did. But we didn't do one on that. Did no, we? we didn't. We didn't. No. So it, it barely didn't make the cut. It was pretty close. There was a right. chance that it, an institutional focus might be the better way to go. And in the institutional focus, you throw an ICANN and an IGF into that, even yeah. though they're completely different. Yeah. It's really hard to discuss those two topics side by side. Some will uh, deep dive well, into who well, is. Then you have the ITU. And, well, what, what we might see in the... Well, the IGF is always a discussion of the ITU. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like we said earlier, the submissions regarding DNS abuse might not end up in the survey word for word, but elements of them may end up in two separate sessions on right. institutions and on security. Security. Um, so are there any other thoughts on, on the security front before we kind of keep moving down the list or the what's called trust? Um, okay. So we also received a fair number of submissions in the inclusion category. Um, Steve, it looks like you have the nine of them. Yeah. Um, and those covered connectivity um, with a big emphasis on broadband infrastructure and different elements of that, including um, spectrum, rural and indigenous connectivity. There was a mention of agricultural technology as being a 
driver of the demand for rural connectivity. Um, there was mentions of the disabled community. Disabil disabled access to tech would have been inclusion. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Your list. Yeah, so um, but also accessibility aspects of that. Um, digital literacy with an emphasis on partnering with educational institutions and libraries and kind of the role that a lot of this infrastructure plays in training America's workforce or kind of preparing yeah. them for. And inclusion is one of the three that the IGF Global has picked. Four. There's four. now four. four. Environment added to four. They added a four. Right. Hey, Dustin. Yes. This is Dan Caprio. Sorry, I was on on uh, mute, um, and I didn't I didn't realize it. Um, before we get to dive too far into this, I just wanted to comment on the the, the last section. Um, I was really gratified um, at the 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 not newfound but refound interest in Internet of Things with the, the different panel um, submissions, and I I, I know we're kind of lumping that under um, cybersecurity, but I think. You know what we were, and Melinda, Steve. I mean, we all talked about this last year, but it might have just been a little ahead of its time. But I mean, what we're really starting to see with the IoT is the confluence of policy and standards, which I think is really interesting. You know, from an ANISA perspective, from a NIST perspective, and how you've got a lot of high-level um, uh, industry support. You know, potentially for an ISO standard. Um, but I think there's a lot of there's a lot of newfound interest in in the IoT as people begin to realize that you know that, that the standards process, a while long and arduous, is beginning to take hold. So I just wanted to to uh, flag that because I think I think there's um, you know there's there's a nice opportunity for us to, to do something we talked about last year, but maybe just wasn't um, you know it hadn't quite come to maturity, which is to, to consider, you know, what's the, where's the sort of global interplay related to policy and related to standards, you know, to get us to a safer Internet of Things. And Dan, this is Steve, you know, this, the next step here is we put this out for 150 people to rank them so that the top eight get to the IGF, right, the IGF USA. And so how would we, I mean, I can, I can guarantee that if we called it standards discussion, it is not going to, and everybody in the room is agreeing with me, it is not going to win. It's not going to win a top eight place. So can you combine it with security or privacy or combine it with 5G as another buzzword that would attract attention? Because I note that there were three times that people put in IoT and in two of them, they talk about spectrum. Is IoT naturally paired with 5G for this year, do you think? Uh, yeah, let me let me think about that. That's a that's a good that's a good uh, a, a good helpful reminder. And standards could yeah, be I what wonder, you end up talking about if it gets picked, but it won't be picked because it says standards. Exactly. Seriously. Right. Right. I'm just, I wonder. I'm no can I just, here. No, no, no. I know you're you're trying to be helpful. I just can I just ask you a quick question? I wonder if this is more IGFE. Um, I wonder if there's a values discussion to be had with the IoT, which relates, understand. well, in terms of shared values, so that sort of gets to 5G and, and, and. Um, what do you mean by uh, shared values? Chi China, China. Um, Wait, values in terms of ethics or a value proposition on why? No, dem democratic, democratic values. So uh, democratic values in terms of a, a standards process that's going to lead to a more secure internet or some more secure internet of things and you know to avoid balkanization is there some is there i a, have to give dan some credit because he's thinking like a marketing guy by want, finding a way to get the word china wrapped into an iot description good thinking dan <laughs> yeah well that's what i'm that's what i'm thinking so let, let me just continue <laughs> thinking on it but but um i i, I you know i i, I want to wrap I want to wrap China into this without China bashing. So let me think about it. All right, thanks, guys. Sorry for the interruption. No, 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 no. That, no. That, was well, that, that was that's exactly what we need to be doing yeah. here. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And and yeah. Um, and where were we? Uh, inclusion. We had 
10 yeah. of inclusion, and we were just yeah, wrapping so we were, that up. We were on inclusion, and I... Are we destined to have inclusion because it made the IGF global top four? Top four. So, but also, there's so many different groups that are interested in inclusion, and I thought there's always something new to be said. Uh, there are new things that are developing in the inclusion area. Yeah, I know that um, Judith couldn't join us because she's on a, a work assignment. She'd be speaking for it. Um, yeah. But Francella, I don't know if you had a chance to look at some of the other submissions that were received around inclusion and if you have any particular thoughts on what you saw and any trends uh, that emerged from your perspective. Um, hi there, um, Dustin, it is Francella. And some of the things I'm like, I think that in general, um, inclusion is something that we have to continue to talk about, especially when it comes to um, the difference between actually just having access and adoption, but really just being, oh, can you hear, are you guys getting feedback? Okay, sorry. Okay, let me take this off of, uh, sorry, my headphones. Sorry about that. Hi. Hopefully this is, hopefully this is better. Um, <clears throat> But uh, I did look at just a couple of these things that are listed. Um, I don't necessarily think that there's one way to get it right, but I do want to make sure that it's, um, I hope that it's at least one of the final topics, um, because I think that we would be remiss to talk about just the, the general ecosystem and not really acknowledge um, who's not getting to be a part of it. And actually, um, another side of that is what are we missing out on when we have these large populations of people who are disconnected? So, you know, from my point of view, that's something that is uh, really an essential piece of this. Okay, thank you for that. And I, I think maybe the, if you don't mind, once we have our kind of 15 consolidated subjects for the, the survey, if you wouldn't mind looking at the inclusion one to make sure that from your perspective, we captured it well, we may not have got it perfect, but that ultimately is up to the, uh, you know, the panel teams to, to find yeah. things. Okay, I will definitely do so, please, yes. Okay. Hi, this is Rick. Rick Lane? Yes, yes, sorry. I didn't realize that there was a mute until Dan said it, and I was like trying to talk um, with Steve, and you guys are talking about the DNS abuse issue. Um, but finally figured it out once Dan mentioned to you. <laughs> so anyhow, um, I guess my question to what Steve was saying on the issue of DNS and kind of bashing the IP attorneys, which is fine because I'm not an attorney, um, but the but the issue of everything that's going on with you know the .org and and who is and all that is it is by its definition internet governance. And this is the Internet Governance Forum. So I don't know why we would negotiate against ourselves and put it out there to see if there is interest in this topic. As it relates to IGF, I think it is a cybersecurity issue, the who is issue. Um, it's not because some folks lost, but because the Federal Trade Commission, Department of Justice, has said that it's a security issue, as did the board of ICANN and by raise of hands. So I guess my question is, so I guess yeah, my Rick. question, uh, I'm sorry, was I done? Okay, I'm done, I guess. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. No, 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 you, you, I, I'm done. We, we don't have to uh, debate the merits of it. It was a packaging -ish question that I wanted you, your opinion on. To package it so that it will be attractive to the survey respondents, is it better, in your opinion, to package it as an ICANN, examining ICANN as an institution or is it better to be focusing on things like DNS abuse, stopping abuse? How do you feel the best way to package those issues is? I, I think the best way is to package it as the combination of the two, right? Because they're interrelated. You have the issues of ICANN and DNS abuse, and you also have the issues of who is and GDPR, and some of the problems associated with the internet governance organization because that's what i can is by definition dealing with issues that are outside its ability to deal with and how do and how from an internet governance perspective do we do that within the multi-stakeholder process so i think they're both interrelated and i think you can combine and i think 
if you're looking and maybe I misinterpreted or misunderstood, you're talking about the rankings last year. Um, I think this year is a little bit different. Um, when I brought up Section 230 last year, everyone said, "Oh, that's not really being discussed," and I think it is now. Um, so we were ahead of <laughs> we were ahead of the panel. What are you talking about? We we actually featured a panel on 230 last year. I know, I know. I I pushed hard for that, but anyhow, um, this, there, I do think that times have changed. That there is a greater focus on some of the internet governance issues as they relate to ICANN and IGF and. ISOC, the Internet Society as well, um, and some of the questions around that. So I do think that there is, uh, it's, it's now being part, written up in the Wall Street Journal. We never had stories about .org or ICANN or any of internet governance issues like that in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times or the Washington Post. And you're seeing it more and more. So I guess my view would be to have it wrapped in, and the question is around internet governance issues, um, and the institutions that are related to that. And, that, and that's where I think the discussion earlier was. We were, you we were saying, let's risk it this year and uh, have a DNS abuse discussion that includes a discussion of uh, ICANN as a governance institution. Yeah, that's well, awesome. it's more than yeah, more than DNS, but just who is you know, the, the .org issues, you know, all those types of issues that are you can, kind of outside the normal realm and scope that I can maybe have the ability to deal with. So let me try to get us all using the same language. So it sounds to me that we're talking about two paths. And we touched on this a little bit uh, previously, that we could either stick to, let's let's use the word themes, right? There's those the four IGF themes, um, which are data, privacy, inclusion, trust, and environment. Right? So we have themes and we could try to center our sessions around theme and then get different institutions in there and, and get the get the folks. Alternatively, so let's call it plan B, we could um, switch it up and say, we're going to talk about uh, a broader subject area. And in each one of those, in this case, we're talking about ICANN and say, okay, well, ICANN and other governance institutes, IGF, what are you doing relative to those four themes? In the sector of, what did we talk about? Um, journalism, what's being dealt with in terms of privacy and trust? Do we want to do you know, kind of layer the themes that way or use the themes as the guide. Is that in, in the old IGFs they called them cross cutting themes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But last year, plan three, plan C is what we did last year, is that we made sure we had a panel on each of the three IGF mm -hmm. things. And those three are back this year. Yeah. But the other five things we did were things we were well, interesting that. to a, a US audience. We didn't give a damn right. if it maps to the IGF theme. So it's a third method, which yep. is to make sure we get covered three of the four, because I doubt we will find an interest in environmental sustainability. Not at this point. Not at this point. I don't think so. But maybe. So another alternative well, is to go ahead and give them their due for the IGF global, but then pay attention to what Americans care about for the other five. The other five. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we, we actually that there's no interest in it, but it didn't really make it into the call for topics. So it wouldn't organically it did not come it did up. not organically yeah. find its way into our call for topics. Yeah, and I don't that. think we have to do that. And the other thing I as I remember is that we took some of those other topics to the IGF. Sure, we we do we do that. Right. But we don't have to be I mean the cross cutting theme thing is difficult. It's easy to visualize in a matrix. You put a matrix with panels down the side and themes yeah. across cutting. I remember doing that 15 years ago. But in operation, when you're actually doing it, it never happens that way. Yeah, it's it makes it very right hard for the panels to, yeah. to actually come up with the most effective panel. Right. I, as a moderator, just try to force your five panelists to fact to factor in IGF theme number two into yeah. their next set of remarks. No, they ignore the question and go off and give their speeches, like they did to Lee Rainey last year. It was so sad. Good point. Um, Don't you think we should at least 
at least a fallback like we did last yeah. year is make sure that we have uh, one for the top three themes, so be data, trust, and inclusion. We'll wait and see on if there's interest in environment and sustainability. And then we have potentially four or five that we can pick. The only way there's going to be interest in environment is if we add that now right. after the fact because it didn't organically make it onto one, the list. One person puts sustainability. So we could try, okay. Right. So there was, there was one submission and it's submission 44 for people's reference. Um, it was kind of a a list. I just pasted it in the chat. So it was a list, but it said um, discuss technical specifications of wireless standard IPv6 and next. I don't know what is next, but um, oh, so it, I think that's a typo. It should be sustainability. It should be the SDGs. No. So if you look at the last one, it says climate change and IT infrastructure. Oh, okay. So oh, sorry, yeah, no. So there is that was the only. Okay. mention of it in the entire and then the UN theme I've heard you call it sustainability or environment which is it really called so the, the fourth UN environment theme. is the one word because we're doing one word for each but the definition let me see here got it. Maybe Anya are you still on yeah I was just gonna say Anya could probably tell us quicker you see here looks like so um... hi sorry yes yeah. <laughs> I am on the mute button. button. <laughs> yes, the mute button, exactly. You understand me? Yes. So, so sorry, Dustin. Yes. So the, the question was about the the terminology. If I'm not wrong, or maybe you could just repeat. Yeah. So um, we were figuring out the official term that's been being used for the fourth track around um, environmental <laughs> sustainability is the yes. word. What should we be using for our terminology? So, I mean, the the, the the final wording that the MEG agreed on just a week ago is, you know, the environment, that's the fourth theme. But initially, the MEG suggested and wanted to uh, double check with the community through this call for validation of thematic tracks, is that the four, well, possible fourth um, theme is called the sustainability which would include the environmental sustainability, climate change, and digital economy. But then because of the community that advised, uh, I'm being very firm that they really want to focus on environment, then they Meg, decided that maybe sustainability is more like cross-cutting across, uh, I mean, across the three other topics, themes. And so they decided to be more obvious to people to really focus on environment and, um, and you know, try to, um, Try to now develop a narrative to see what exactly feeds into that theme. Okay. I will update my terminology. <laughs> and I gather it, it seemed to be Thank sort you, of a, a tentative. People weren't absolutely sure what that would mean when they put it up there. Uh, is that what do you mean? That, that when it, they put up evolved. environment, they didn't actually have, from what I read, didn't have filled out what that might really mean. In a, in a topic area. But it sounds now like it is more defined. Yeah. 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 Um, so yes, yeah, if we were to put that on the on the survey, we would be forcing it a little bit based on the number of good topics that we received with yeah. a lot of thought put into them. Um, whereas this one, it was mentioned once. So I mean, in theory, are we you inclined to what? Uh, to one Dustin, uh, sorry, it's uh, Matt, um, and, and sorry to interrupt, Steve. Uh, the only thing that I can think of that might salvage that topic is um, something that I've heard of very recently, which is uh, mesh networking. And there has been some discussion of people having like mesh networks that um, connect to solar panel systems. Um, I so I, I've been volunteering with NYC Mesh, which is this organization that um, I think it's actually funded by ISOC, but they they set up rooftop point-to-point um, -point systems that connect to like an internet backbone in a certain place. And there has been discussion of like other people um, out in like rural New York putting up solar panels that would connect to these mesh networks. So it's kind of like a wireless ISP, but also with like sustainability involved. Um, there's some discussion of that, but I think it's still very early on. So I, I don't know how many people you, or panelists you might be able to find, but it's maybe yeah. something to consider down the road. That could end up fitting into the uh, 
the discussion around connectivity and inclusion. Um, and uh, I know we have some people from ISOC online. I, ISOC has certainly provided them with grants, but uh, they have their own sustainable business model. If anybody else wants to chime in on that, that's fine. But, uh, but we have two questions in front of us. Do, do we even ask the IGF USA public whether an environment topic would be ranked high enough to take one of our ETH slots? Do we even ask, given that it didn't, it didn't explicitly come up? Yeah. Um, we have an excuse to do so by claiming it was a late-breaking fourth global theme right. of the IGF that we feed into. So we can make an excuse for that, and it may or may not score high. Yeah. Well, I think one thing that we had discussed um, is that in addition to having there being a good ranking for the topic, we also need someone who can build a panel around ownership. This subject <laughs> area. So prior to surveying or after surveying if it wins. Yes. Yeah. Well, so so after surveying it if it wins, yes. Let's cross that bridge when we come to it. But also I you know there are a lot of good topics in here. So it's damn right. <laughs> so it's it is a discussion. I mean, if, if somebody says, I can call up Bezos and have him come talk about how he's spending $10 billion, we'll take it. So, right, but I mean, it'll be what? too late. If we, we have to make a decision whether to put it in the survey. Right. So, and then yeah. we'll cross, if it gets picked in the top eight, then we end so, up having to find it. So why don't we open it up and see, is there anybody that really wants to see the environment as a topic on our survey for our community to rank and determine whether or not it has enough interest to develop a panel. Well, I'm a, I'm a rabid environmentalist and activist on it. I don't think it's at a state. I just find it, it difficult. You know, you talk about the excessive use of electricity for blockchain. I mean, there are topics one to deal with, or the mesh network thing, or you could say edu use of the internet for education in areas where they're subject to, you know, problems. But I don't think we have it developed enough to really come out and say, given all the other topics, to say, let's try to push it. Just because IGF is coming, I think it's a valid topic, but I don't think we're there. Okay. I just don't think we're there. Anybody? Does anybody want to push for it? I'm the people on the phone either. Yeah, I think if, if we didn't receive it in the call for topics and nobody, if there was somebody that was willing to speak up on it and take a you know, a potential lead on it at one point, then I would say, let's give it a shot. But I think yeah. let's kind of agree that it won't be included in the survey. We don't have a, a mandate for it. There's yeah. no I mandate. I mean, just yeah. random at the end of one right. submission that was largely about something else, um, it's, it's just not a mandate to me. Yeah. And that's how we've operated. Right. 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 Okay. So we decided on that. Um, so just kind of moving through some of the other themes, there were several um, that I think a lot of them probably fell in the the data side of things, but uh, it could be its own topic. It was last year, um, artificial intelligence. There were submissions asking about the, you know, if market regulation is the right path forward, is it enough? Um, how should we be? thinking and preparing for the development of artificial intelligence and looking at some of the different effects of laws on things like data localization, privacy, as well as intellectual property, and what their, the impact of those are on, on AI. Um, so that may be worth adding as its own survey topic. Um, did we do one last year? We did. Yeah. Last year, the working title was Ensuring Genuine Benefits from AI. And it scored high enough to make the eight. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It turned out to be a pretty good panel. Um, and no, that, it, there was some good discussion back and forth on it. At the IGF in Berlin, oh, yeah. I listened to the debate over a progressive debate that hates the fact that Tesla is gathering all this data and it's helping to drive the roads on North America, but they're not sharing the data with other parts of the world. 
their map, their roads are different. The data is no good in other countries. Each country needs to have a, a bunch of data that it can mine in order to to be able to to use it. So I think there's a lot of uh, developing world versus developed world tension over AI in terms of where the data comes from. Yeah. What else? Um, moving down the list, there was also several mentions of antitrust kind of in from two angles, one looking at the kind of the validity of the consumer welfare standard in the, the modern, more digital economy. Um, and then also the application or use of antitrust as a political of, cudgel punishment. Yes. Yeah. Right, where the administration wants to punish platforms that it doesn't feel are moderating conservatives as in a friendly way. And uh, and last year on the antitrust panel, we attempted to to not devolve into an arcane discussion of antitrust law. Do you think we succeeded? I was in the room for that one. I thought it, I thought they they honored the promise not to deep dive. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't too bad at all. Yeah, it, it, I didn't feel that it was uh, you needed a law degree to be able to follow. Law. It, it was more about effectiveness and can it work? I mean, you know that in this town in July, it will be, it will still be a hot topic. Yeah. But the Justice Department wants to punish its social media for conservative moderation in a number of ways. Talk about 230, opening up lawsuits on encryption yeah. and antitrust. So there's a, and it's not even a populist tech clash. It's more of the administration pushing yeah. a certain law. And its allies. I, I would strongly disagree with that. I mean, what would you say? That's a, it's, common, it's commentary. So the fact that they're looking at massive companies and monopolies and harm on the internet is not, it's not because they're out to punish, they're out to protect. And so I think that's a very strong mischaracterization. Then you and I will uh, definitely. What do you think? Right. So how should, should, should antitrust versus. I mean, how do you want to position and, and again, I'm not a big believer in the breaking up of companies. I don't think it solves problems. So, you know, I'm not in that category. So I'm not defending and I'd probably be, at, you know, depending on the evidence, the other side of breaking up companies. Um, but I, I just think that the very, it's nice rhetoric, but it's not necessarily the reality. Right. And uh, so we won't debate that here. We'll debate that on the panel. So I, what, but should we should we position having a candidate panel out there, and what should it be titled? Because we, we had two submissions on antitrust. And I would add uh, add in, you could add in also to make it spread is what Europe is attempt also would like to do has done. So I think it's not just a U.S. idea. How it's implemented can be different, but that would be sort of like GDPR, where you'd have a broader you know, a broader concern with big companies and their effect, and what are the different ways people are trying to handle it. Mm -hmm. Is that closer to your? Uh... <laughs> I mean, it's hard for all of these to not just sound like a third year law class, and that's going to be the challenge, right? Is how to make this something that's accessible to people, and what. Rick said that I really liked was he said, you know, when he said, no, it is, it's about protecting from harm. And so if we can couch it in a way that somebody could actually articulate that and say, no, these are the harms, that's something a little more realistic to people. And then if somebody can then say, well, no, actually, that's, then you're, you're going into this category. But I think it has to be a little more tangible mm -hmm. and less lawyer. So um, it's totally theoretical, but, you know, maybe the discussion is, um, you know, what, if we were starting from a blank page, what would we want it to look like? You know, is it the European being... model, you know, what would antitrust look like, okay. knowing what we are today if we were writing the laws from scratch today? Well, and again, what you, standards? You know, is it the European model, uh, yay or nay? Is having lived through else? the breakup of AT&T, it had significant positive effects, I would say. I mean, I, it just, that's on a macro level. I mean, or standard are. oil. Or standard oil. Yeah. Yeah. So there is, uh, so I, but I think if, it, if it's put to what is the effect on you and us, for example, if, if you're a huge company, you can buy up new ideas 
and submerge them. I mean, they're just there are a yeah. lot of concrete examples that affect us individually. Mm -hmm. Putting aside a lot of technical discussion of when, how does I uh, antitrust work or not work. So yeah. it would, I think if we do, I agree right. with you completely. It's the effect on us of doing yeah. it or not doing it and why the concerns. And that was the interesting part about the, the debate. I think when he's right or wrong, right? It's like, okay, we're going to throw out a worm like harm. Well, let's define it. And from whose perspective and, and what is it? That to me is a little more, and if we keep it personal and not reading statute, that to me seems a little more interesting. I like the very good point. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. debate over the consumer welfare standard is yeah. supposed to be that. It's supposed to be discussing who you're protecting, the consumers or the competitors. And who are the consumers? When you're getting it, when you're getting free services, right. is it, you're gonna even be able to find harm. Right. It's harder. So we have to you know, 50 AGs have signed on to that antitrust case, and they've just begun their work. There's no, there's no um, public theory of where the harm is yet. Uh, that could be out by July, but yeah. they're just not there yet. They're not there, but that's. But it does show that they think it's politically popular to do. So that's. I know. <laughs> so, but that's, but but it's, but it, it's, it's why the topic. <laughs> no, and I think the political mm -hmm. angle is Rick's right. It's not the only angle, but it's certainly the most interesting part of it. Got the sizzle. Well, I mean, you would add, if you're talking about the politics of, you know, 230, you know, add the Democrats to that, like Biden, right? So it's not just the Justice Department. I mean, there's others as well. So it's more interesting from that standpoint. That's right. And we'll be right in the middle of the Democrats. Uh, they may not have even picked a nominee by the IGF. You say, when is the yes, Democratic well, Convention? It's in June. <laughs> August. August. <laughs> we'll have a nominee by August. Um, so back to just kind of rounding out the antitrust discussion, a focus on finding a way to mesh the discussion around harms and how we should be defining those harms with the kind of political angle of. So, I, you know, I teed it up like this, I said, targeting tech for political purposes or to protect consumers? You know, we raise the question that way and have that debate. Is the consumer welfare standard still the best framework? These are things that came up. What else after antitrust? So I guess we could, um, I know we've already mentioned it several times, but there were also several submissions around um, the, the platform liability mm -hmm. discussion mm -hmm. yep. and, uh, you know, how, how we should be dealing with that. I know that it's been, you know, there's some overlap with encryption and all of these other issue areas, um, but I'm sure that that needs to have its own discussion as well, because it's a pretty, pretty popular and hot topic right now. Well, the platform, there was at least four folks who said platform moderation of user news and views and liability for user content. If, if we lump that together, we have four submissions on that. Yeah. The policy debate for changes to intermediary liability, uh, moderation of content, should online platforms be liable, disinformation and liability for that. And, and it's, I mean, it's still a very hot topic. So I, I, I think it, it certainly deserves to be surveyed. If we ended up doing um, digital dynamics of the election, then misinformation, fake news become dealt with in that topic. Yeah. And someone could say that the way to solve fake news is to make the platforms liable for it. And then they'd have to fact check everything that anybody ever said. So that could come up there, but that's not really a deep dive into 230. The encryption debate, somebody might say that Senator Graham wants to scare the tech companies away from end-to-end -end encryption, and the way one of the ways he's considering doing that is exposing the liability under 230. So 230, in that case, is sort of a weapon yep. to achieve his encryption objective. Mm -hmm. 230 could come up two or three times. Yeah. Um, there's also or more. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, We're going to figure out. Depends if I'm there or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the climate aspects of the two thirty. There it is. Make uh, make social media 
liable for the global warming caused by the users who are heating their homes and they're running their computers. So, so how, do, how do we convert the hot air on Twitter into powering the computers that it's written on? <laughs> Environmental um, impact of cloud servers. Um, okay, so to make sure that we get through all of these, um, I'm just going to move it along. We have also discussion around um, kind of employment and commerce in the context of the gig economy and peer-to-peer -peer services such as Airbnb or Duro or different car rental exchanges. Um, I counted nine topics suggested that fit into the category that Dustin just introduced. I threw out a name called Digital Innovation and Disruption, and that covers peer-to-peer. -peer. Are they entrepreneurs or are they employees? AB5 in California and there's federal bill. This is huge. Micro mobility and Europe. scooters. It's also in Europe. It's in California and it's in Congress, IGF USA. Let's yeah. we can we got plenty there, John, right? Um peer to peer sharing of homes and cars, economic opportunity, disrupting big business in hotel and rental car. And then since you say digital innovation, maybe there's a positive side. This technology can impact the development and economic growth. And what about uh some of the ones that it, news media sustainability, the Rupert Murdoch project, right? And uh, Sicilene's bill, trying to sustain news media in the digital age and what's the role of journalists and media platforms. And that's the disruption issue. You also have social medical, media disruption. The medical, the medical area. Which wasn't suggested, but yeah. it comes up, that wasn't one of the topics. Digital education, which is a positive. The role of cyber physical systems and what they mean to internet governance. I, I really don't know what they meant by that, but. Mm -hmm. And then precision agriculture is a digital innovation, yeah. which so I, I try to find that like there's nine things that could fit under a digital innovation, which is positive, but innovation can also cause disruption as the as the flip side. How does how does that sound as a potential? Well, I would add one thing because it's not just disruption, but maybe we do a back to the future where in the old days we all argued that policy should be technology neutral, and now we're in a point where they're not. So technology neutrality, does it still apply in 2020? Was that one of the submissions? Or is it a different way to frame things we already got? I think it's a different way to frame it. It's a different way to frame it because you're framing it as there's, there's tech lash because of disruption and the public policy question that we all used to fight for in the old days was that policy should be technology neutral. So what happens online should be the same that happens offline. And just because you're online doesn't mean your policy should change. So have we drifted away from that? Okay, well, so, yeah. let's see. So there was also question of elections and uh, you know, the role of the internet in that, um, both from a security perspective, um, but also, you know, from a more like blunder perspective, like you might see in uh, right. certain Faulty Western apps. states. Yeah. Um, or Are we or blaming also, the internet for what happened in Iowa? Is that where we are now? No, but it's, it's a reliance of software of software that you know they're kind of taking advantage of the internet to more <laughs> be more efficient with recording things and it out um in every case and then and if we did talk about elections you want to suck in those misinformation fake news exactly. moderating users news and views yep it's not just a security issue it's all right it's exactly. everything it's data there's a lot of stuff going oh, yeah. on being in an election year, I imagine right. there'd be a lot of. I think it would be good. I mean, there's some folks. I mean, I don't think I'm revealing anything here, probably, but I had a fantastic conversation in fall 2018. It was at a political fundraiser with Bitzer, and it was personally reassuring to hear him say the internet should be nowhere near this. Wow. This is right. Bitzer mm -hmm. said the internet should be nowhere near this voting. <clears throat> that could be an interesting topic. Yeah. Hi there. Can I can I just question. chime in on something when we get a chance? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Sorry, because I couldn't. I forgot that I was on mute earlier when you guys were talking about um, texting neutral. And I think that a really um, important uh, point because I did notice some of the AI um, 
um, note is to really put out there that I don't think that tech is neutral. And I think that that's something that maybe it's worth discussing, but I just think that, um, uh, I, I think when people say that tech is neutral, I, I think, I, I, I just disagree with that, <laughs> so. Or I wasn't saying tech is neutral. I think policies around tech. That I agree with you. That tech can. <laughs> there are obviously examples of tech not being neutral. Um, the use of technology not okay. being neutral, useful, neutral. Okay, got it. Okay, thanks. Cool. So, and then just moving through some of the um, other kind of emerging themes. There was one on taxation and that coming from the European <laughs> Union for digital advertising well, as well as within, cross the US within the US, right? Like Maryland has an ad tax. Um, I don't think that was, that was mine, but I don't think it's going to score very well this year either. <laughs> um, this was, is, well, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Um, this is Kelly. And um, I don't know a lot of you that all that well, but it's, I was kind of going through the list while, while listening to the conversation here and it seems to me there's a number of, of uh, rows or recommendations or suggestions that in my mind seem to fit within the bubble of education. And that doesn't necessarily mean higher education, although it certainly can. It could also mean K through 12. And um, some of you may have seen recently the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation recently published another article indicating that their $450 million investment into improving education globally has failed. So in my mind, I think we all have to start thinking differently about the fundamentals and it starts with our children. So if we start educating our children differently and using this forum as a means to drive that conversation, we could potentially make some really interesting uh, impact at least bring conversations to light. And things that we could include could include things like references to the declining numbers of university enrollments, the alternatives to higher education that are being pursued, um, as well as overcrowding, insufficient facilities, lack of maintenance at the facilities, and tribal community access. Um, as well as certifications and standards, because once the teachers are certified on certain topics, then they'll pass those um, subjects along, including things like AI, AR, VR, of course, IoT falls in that, um, and machine learning. So um, I counted, I think, 10 or 11 rows on the, I downloaded it in the spreadsheet, um, I counted maybe 10 or 11 that we could perhaps bundle into an interesting conversation. And I thought maybe that was just worth, worth a minute to think about. Yeah, thanks for that input. In terms of thinking of how to frame that, perhaps in, just in the overarching subjects, uh, maybe looking at that in one of the elements of inclusion, perhaps, and... Uh, those same 10 rows, I, I bet all made their way into the inclusion topic yeah. on most of our homework sheets. And I think that's a, an interesting topic, or sorry, an interesting, yeah, an interesting topic to, to talk about those themes because it does impact yeah, cause I, several different cause things and, how we access and what standards. Yeah, and inclusion is a broad topic, so there's the connectivity aspect of it and then there's the education aspect of it. You say inclusion. Um, for access and education. Mm -hmm. So if we called it that, we'd be able to jam it into the inclusion IGF topic. Mm -hmm. And we already have all of those rows uh, that Kelly identified yeah. buried in the, in the inclusion. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I definitely want to go look at that report. Do you know offhand if, it, if the money that the foundation put in, was that global or just in the U.S.? It was global, but um, there was another report that just came out that I can't find, but let me share a couple of the links. Um, and I think uh, I'll, I'll post those into the chat. And I think it's also interesting um, from a family perspective, my, one of my nieces has autism and um, she's, a, so she's on the Asperger's spectrum. And, you know, I just think about her, but I also think about different types of learning styles 
and how, you know, our current public school education, my son is 14, he just started high school, and I've been a volunteer with a number of universities for a number of years, um, help, uh, helping advise collegians. And I, I just see how people have different learning styles and with the technology that's available broadly um, on the internet, of course, and on the types of de devices we're using to access, that there's so many different ways it can be used and harnessed and get just get people to think differently, whether they have a quote unquote, a specific ability or disability, depending on who you talk to, but just learning styles, right? Um, and you know, a very good friend of ours, uh, her son uh, lost his sight in a skateboarding accident a number of years ago. So he does a lot of his work, he's a university student now, and he does a lot of his work using audio. Um, so, you know, more like the artificial intelligence. So I think there's um, some really interesting ways that we can all take these topics, but I'll find those articles and I'll post those out for you guys to quick reference. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Kelly, could you also um, email me the, the 10 inputs yeah. that you've highlighted? Um, okay. So we can look at like maybe one connectivity and one inclusion plus accessibility type of yeah. panel. Uh, sure. So that would be great. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, and then this is bringing us pretty close to the end. There was um, one talking about the ethics of emerging tech. Um, highlighting, you know, AI, machine learning, AR, VR, IoT, and things like that. Um, there was, there were several that kind of brought to light the kind of tension in internet policy making between different levels of government, whether it's like a tension between a city and the federal government, state and federal government, or, um, you know, maybe different departments within the federal government. Uh, different now. Another place for 230. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Looking forward to that at every panel, Rick. <laughs> um, and then um, I guess, that, you know, if, if there's anything I missed, please uh, chime in. But I think that pretty much. Uh, I mean, we cer certainly missed some specifics, but in terms of the themes and general ideas that we pulled out of that, um, I think we covered a lot of ground here um, and can use the remainder of our time to kind of talk about what the survey process is going to look like. Is there anything else before we move on to the discussion of the survey itself? Okay. Um, so with that, I am going to bring us to what the survey looked like last year, just as a reminder. So we collected information on stakeholder group, how many IGF USAs have been attended, how many IGFs have been attended, and then we asked the respondents to rank our 15 topics, one through 15, and we Cut the, cut the data from the responses in a number of ways, showing how many certain topics at their number one, how many were ranked in the kind of top three, and then how many were ranked in the top eight as well. And we used that to, um, in, in kind of uh, partnership with who was willing to take a lead on something, like we mentioned earlier, we do need somebody to build a good panel around these. So, um, so we need there to be interest in that. Um, and so basically you just, the way that this works is you would give them each a number and you can drag and, and drop them. Um, did any of you know that you could drag those rows on last year's survey? <laughs> nope. Told you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so are you just demonstration, please? So if you uh, 
And narrow rate, mm -hmm. you're clicking and right clicking and double clicking. Oh, it's right? just a normal click. Okay. It's a normal click, and you drag it to the position you'd like it to be in. Um, it was a challenge to I think I did number them and renumber them, and yet 110 of us did it. 120. 120 of us did it, and an average of six minutes each, Justin, the old-fashioned way. Justin, I have a question for you. It shouldn't. Yes, Judith. Justin? Yes. So my question is, is this, is on, this is on new survey, right? No, no. We haven't built the survey yet. I'm using this. Oh, as okay, because I answered it thinking it was a new one. Does it look different from last year's? It looks like we had no, the, the current topics. No, it's the same one. No, it's true. So, okay. um, so no, this is just so an example. Ignore my. Okay, ignore my filling it out. Okay. <laughs> um, but thank I you for your. your thing, so. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Um, but as far as the uh, the survey goes. Um, I think the ranking proved to be a very effective way to measure interest because what we found with the old kind of Likert style scale is that we think all these issues are important. So it's hard to say that where somebody important. would rank theirs high and all the rest low, which didn't give us very much information. Um, so this requires a little bit of thought, which we want. Yeah. I mean, do we know how many people started and then abandoned their survey? Well, so according <laughs> to the survey monkey statistics, it was a hundred percent completion rate. Jeez, so for 120 people. Yeah. I don't know why we would mess with this. Exactly. This, this is That's proven. Cool. We didn't even know about Dustin's secret <laughs> technique of drag and drop. Did anybody on the phone know that you could drag and drop them? No. No. Say that? Because <laughs> Justin was thinking that maybe that's why they were completed so well, is because everybody knew how easy it was. So now it's going to be interesting to see that when you know the drag and drop, what is the mean completion time? Does it go up or down? Yeah. Right. <laughs> It'll go down. <laughs> it should go down. Um, question. It's, you're very, your voice is very faint. Okay. Is this better? Um, no. no. Is that not better? I, I can hear you. I'll repeat your question. Okay. Um, I'm a bit of a newcomer, so I'm, if you discuss this already, uh, just never mind. But have you had a discussion about uh, what happens to the data that you're collecting here? Who's in charge of it? Where is, where is it housed? What's going to happen with it? Is that in scope or for you all or out of scope? Um, in terms of the the data we collect, we don't actually collect any personal data. It's just um, stakeholder group, how many, we don't even ask for name or email address. Um, so it's just basically like, what what's your stakeholder group? How many IGF USAs have you attended? How many global IGFs? Um, how do you rank the following topics? And then the final question is, uh, you know, did we miss anything? It's kind of an a last opportunity to kind of opine on the, the slate of topics. Um, is, is that what you were concerned about or was there um, something else in terms of the the data we collect? It's um, published by the by ISOC DC as the, the secretariat of the IGF USA. Right. So I, um, I may be in the minority here, but I, I think that there are some questions there that uh, would be useful to answer maybe or to describe in advance. Uh, personally, when somebody wants to take a survey and wants me to answer questions, I, I always want to understand better why and who is doing it and where the data is going and who all has access to it. Um, while it may seem like there's uh, no personal uh, data, uh, you may be defining that uh, pretty narrowly, I'm not sure, but uh, it's very hard to keep um, the data in confines. So that that's just my concern. I, and that since nothing is mentioned about that, I would wonder 
about that myself. Is that clear? Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. And I mean, I, I suppose that, I, I mean, I can dig into what SurveyMonkey's policies are, but. Um, I don't think they, it's very privacy. Um, probably not, but I don't know that any survey process, you know, we, we do have to use a survey software for this. And there are a variety of forms we, you know, options that we have. We've used SurveyMonkey in the past, and um, I'm. If you have a privacy-friendly alternative that meets our needs, would certainly be happy to to look at it. Um, but you know, I don't want to try to misrepresent what SurveyMonkey does and does not do with the data, because that's you know we're not the controller of that. That data. Um, I mean, we can ask. You, we can provide more information on why you're filling out the survey and what we, why we need people to fill this out for the contribution to the, the, um, you know, the, the conference itself. But I don't want to try to. I'm not a lawyer. I don't want to try to define what SurveyMonkey is and is not using with the data. Certainly. Well, if there would be any uh, usefulness in in discussing it further, I would. Not Survey Monkey, but you know how to uh, give an overview to what is going on and and what you know how you're managing the data, so to speak. I'd be happy to assist in that in some way. Back to you. Okay, thank you. If if we do kind of follow that thread, um, we'll certainly include you in the conversation. This was, that was Anne, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you, Anne. Um, so, in terms of kind of the, the questions that we're asking and the data that we're collecting from the questions, um, it seems like people are generally happy with the ranking process, both from filling out of the survey as well as the results that we get out of it. Um, should we be asking anything else, like is there anything useful other than knowing what stakeholder group and um, how many IGFs have been attended? Everybody filled those out. They had to pick something. Yeah. So I'm happy to stick with the same, completely same format if there are no issues. I just wanted to open it up to. Did you have anything in your mind that you might want to ask? No, not really. Um, I'm. I mean, I think it. I do think stakeholder group is an important one to have and it's, it is always helpful to know how many people are newcomers or how many people maybe only came to one in the past and have responded to it but I've been surprised at the number of people who just come in and out for just their own panel or just to attend one one item and it ends up with uh, a lot of empty seats at certain parts of the day if we ask do, do you plan on enjoying the full day and the answers came back no I don't know what we could do with that information we don't know which part of the day they're coming. Yeah. yeah, I think in terms of gathering that information, it's probably better to ask that post registration. Post registration. And so, and, and then get an idea for those that are coming for one issue, which issue that is, because the rooms are different sizes, so we can allocate the rooms accordingly. And there's lunch. Yeah. I mean, right. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't don't we do like pre-registration? I mean, like as you're registering to. Which are you planning to attend? You know, I think uh, the um, Tim Morton does that, I believe. You know, which you know kind of clicks so you can get the right number of seats yeah. for the rooms. You know, when you're registering, you know, yeah. are you going to be for lunch? Are you going to be that? That would be really just to click, you know, check the box. Yeah. Of which I ones like you're that. planning to. I like that. Yeah, and I think we may open up the. We can do something with like a pre-registration, but we'll probably open up before we finalize exactly what the topics are because we want to get people signed up and get it on their calendars as early as possible. But then we can have kind of a second round. Of, like, please let us know which which session she'll be attending. Do they when we're in their registering? Do they put their email addresses in? Uh, Yes. Or no, is that the privacy yes. issue that we're just no, talking no, about? Wait. 
because if they do, we can re we can send out an email. You know, thank you for registering. Um, here's the final agenda for the event. Please let us know um, if you're you know which ones you're planning to attend. At least you get some numbers. People probably won't respond to that, but it doesn't hurt to try. Right. So yeah, we'll definitely include that as an option for for registrants. Um, okay, so we're going to consider that decided that we'll use the same survey process. Um, Dustin, and, I had my hand up. Oh, sorry, Judith. All right. Go ahead. All right. So Judith, yep. so my question is, are we? Um, because I can't. I came in late because I'm calling in from South Pacific. Anyway, um, so did are we going to include all the? Since I missed the access discussion, are we going to include all the uh, major themes that are popular on the survey? So is access inclusion and access going to be in there? Um, and how's that so, going so, to go? so let, let's let's talk about the process really quick um so you know we've taken notes we've had a discussion openly about a variety of topics whether we should include certain things whether we sh should not include other there will certainly be something within the the context of connectivity and inclusion um, and as always it probably will perform well on the survey um, but but basically we're going to take all of the inputs and make sure that they you know we're kind of capping it at 15 different panel options to be ranked because beyond that the ranking system becomes slightly unmanageable um, so I you know yes that will be included among the the 15 that we ultimately decide on and once this discussion is kind of codified in the form of a survey and 15 options um, we'll make sure that there are opportunities for those that you know express interest in certain topics to make sure that it's um, adequately representative of the submissions that we received and then based on the results, the top eight that have people to that are interested in taking it forward uh, will will make the cut, and then we'll later decide on which two topics make the the plenary and which six fall into the the breakout category. Um, so those are basically the next steps. We kind of, in terms of what we have left to cover on the agenda. Um, we already covered the results of the call for validation of thematic tracks throughout the discussion. Mm -hmm. So we'll skip along um, to the next steps, which there's a, oh, yeah. um, so there's a timeline that just highlights and all of these, you know, are available on the, on the back side of your handout online for you to kind of download and view at your own leisure. But basically what we're looking at is um, depending on the, the extent of the, the comments on the 15 panel to be ranked that we get, uh, the goal is to send it out on, on Friday, but based on how much everybody procrastinated on the call for topics, I'm not convinced that an extra three days would affect the total number of submissions. So if, if we do need to delay the um, I can meeting in uh, Cancun is is the second half of that entire stretch. Right. So I I, I was just going to say if if we need to take the weekend and send it out on Monday, I think that that is is okay. Um, and just give us who are at I can the, the chance to get back. Right. And yeah. then And then that Monday, keep it open that Monday. What do you think? If you're not yeah. quarantined. No. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, um, you have a lot of time. The I can yeah. So, so the that would um, say keep it open through the 16th. Yeah. Which 16th. is the Monday after the I can meeting, March 16th. If we make it back at all, and then <laughs> I can is holding a call, uh, Rick, with interested parties to discuss what they 
doing a monitor of the situation. Yeah, yeah. they held the call. It's a tough thing. Yeah. Anybody, a tough, anybody on that call? One. Is anybody yeah, here on um, that call? Moeen was on the call and she said they had a lot of health experts on the call and they're adding a lot of health people to the uh, to the thing. They're going to have like Purell everywhere. Um, Mexico has no coronaviruses. Anything that was was not. They are very well prepared. Um, people questioned about um, Kuala Lumpur, but no one was really questioning then they're going to make a decision, I think, tomorrow at the board meeting. Okay, well, I'm saying 16. Right. Yeah, they just yeah so, so in either event, event, what we'll do is uh, um, just to make sure that we get give ourselves more time to get the survey topics right, we'll push back the opening until Monday the 24th, I believe, and then um, close it on Monday the 16th. And then um, we are scheduled to have our next steering committee meeting about a week and a day later on March 24th. So everybody will have about a week to review the survey results um, since it's open through Monday. I can get them to probably by the end of Tuesday, giving you about a week to review it. And then um, as, you know, make sure that if you're interested in, you know, letting that letting it be known that there's interest in planning a topic, uh, a topical panel, then um, please do come to that meeting. And if you can't make that meeting, then send your interest ahead of time so that when we're discussing which topics to cover, we know which ones have people who can take it up and turn it into a great panel. Um, so that's a little bit about the next steps. And is there is there anything else before we close the call? Justin, just thank you so much for doing all this. It's, you're, you've been great. So thank you. Ah, collaborative effort. Yeah, thanks, Dustin. Sorry, I missed the access discussion, but it was 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> No worries. All right. So thanks, everybody. Um, and we will see you um, on the survey, hopefully. Thanks. Great. Bye. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Dustin. Thank you. Thanks, Dustin.